our church have a hard time because that's all they believe in when they come here and when they start learning about repentance. It just throws them for a loop. Because they just thought you just got to believe. See, there's a difference between King James only and King James only. See? <coughs> Amen. <coughs> okay, so nobody has any questions for us? You got any questions for us tonight, Ada? You know all the Bible tonight, huh? Because we'll just pick it up where we left off then. We ain't near done. We're talking about the rapture of the church. And Don, how's uh, Dana doing? concerning the church and how Jesus is coming for His church and He's bringing the dead with Him uh, to raise them from the dead. It's 
so that they can be caught up with the living into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that that should be a comfort. It shouldn't be something to worry about or stress out about or think that you got to uh, get plenty of guns and ammunition for it. <laughs> Again, if you're going to go through the tribulation period, then you're honestly of the opinion that you've got to shoot the Antichrist. Because the Bible does teach, yes, someone is going to try to kill the Antichrist. He's called the idle shepherd. In Zechariah chapter 13. And uh, once someone delivers that terrible mortal blow to him, the false prophet raises him from the dead. Amen? And uh, that's not all. If we Let's go ahead just for fun. Let me show you the verse where the Bible even talks about the militia. <laughs> Did you know the militia has a part to play in the tribulation period? Absolutely. And the Bible acknowledges that. In Micah, chapter 5 and verse 5. Let's look at that real quick. Micah. It's amazing how many uh, verses there are in the minor prophets that talk about this coming seven-year tribulation period and gives us clues as to what's going on against this man of sin when he takes over the world. And uh, here the Bible even tells us who God is going to raise up to resist him. Micah 5.5. 5. You, knew, you knew it had to be double nickel. Right? <laughs> Micah 5.5. 5. And this man shall have seven shepherds and eight principal men. So there's some kind of, uh, you know, governors or mayors or ambassadors, I don't know, there's some kind of eight principal men and seven shepherds that God is going to raise up that will resist this dude when he comes on the scene <coughs> and uh, works for his father, the devil. So, uh, so it's quite interesting. The more you read the Bible, what more you can learn about this time coming in the near future after the Lord raptures His church out of here. Now, it's very important that we look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and remind ourselves that the Bible says here, Verse 14, For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. heaven. Amen. So what is going to happen? Jesus is going to descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain and, the, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. So he's going to descend, the Bible says. He descends. So let's just talk about these three points tonight. One. He is it descends? Am I spelling that right? <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, good. Until I haven't written it in a while. <laughs> then we'll talk about his voice. And then we'll talk about his dead rise. Amen? Okay. Let's put a riser. Amen? <laughs> okay. So he's going to descend. Well, what would that be like? 
means he's just going to come into the atmosphere. He's not going to literally land on the ground and touch the ground with his feet like the Bible says he will at the second advent in Revelation chapter 19 and of course in Malachi when he actually touches his feet at the Mount of Olives and it splits in half and he walks straight in the eastern gate. That's obviously happens later. So let's learn some references now. Let's go to the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Here's this beautiful poem and this beautiful drama uh, that was performed for Solomon, or maybe Solomon wrote this as his uh, this, uh, play of a Solomon song where you see the Shunammite, where you see this girl, this uh, servant girl, and you see the, uh, her boyfriend's the king and she don't know it. And uh, when she gets an uh, invitation to come to the king's palace, she ain't interested because she's got her boyfriend. <laughs> sort of like a West Side Story type of thing, you know? Yeah. And uh, she didn't find out to the end that the king is actually her boyfriend. <laughs> He's kept it from her. And uh, she's just a hard-working girl that works out in the sun all the time. Thinks she doesn't look good enough to be anybody's anything. So it's a beautiful love story. And so what better to understand when the Bible speaks so much of the church being Christ's bride and the Christ being the bridegroom, we see that there's so much here that fits in with Jesus coming back for his church. And so Song of Solomon 2 and verse 8. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. So he's coming, amen? The voice of my beloved. We're talking about the voice. That's our emphasis here tonight. The voice. Amen? Amen. So he cometh, number one. Number two, he stands. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows. Hallelujah. He stands behind our wall of indifference. Amen? You see, He looketh forth at the windows. He looks through the windows of our heart and sees our, our sin. Amen. <laughs> he looks forth at the windows and showing Himself through the lattice. Also, He reveals Himself, showing Himself through the lattice. And of course, the lattice is the uh, scientific word for the breakdown of water. If you want to study scientifically water and the breakdown of water, you have to study the lattice. And the Bible says that he's coming from the north where there's a frozen looking glass sea. And he comes through that water to come to the earth to get us. And it's going to break down so that he can come through it. And he's coming down to get us and he's going to take us back through it when he takes us to heaven. So how's he going to get through that frozen sea? great mirror-like looking glass that is the floor of heaven. Easy. He's looking through the lattice at us. He's watching us. You know, frozen water, if you look through it, it's a giant magnifying glass. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So he's showing himself through the lattice. It's a very interesting term. My beloved spake, and he said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. <coughs> he didn't say, Oh, come up here a minute. Oh, it's time to go back down now. Let's go down. What verse is that? I'm at uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Didn't I say? Yeah. 2-8. Yeah, 2 eight. So it's so beautiful. Uh, it's such a perfect picture here. Here we're actually reading this play, this girl and this boy, uh, and this boy looking through the lattice, in other words, he's hiding himself, see, she don't even know, she's out there working away, and uh, there's some kind of lattice work probably near the grapes or something, and so he's, he's hiding behind the lattice, 
watching her, but she don't know it because she sees the grapes growing on the lattice work. It's a pretty picture. <coughs> and that's your Lord watching you. <coughs> so, uh, verse 10, My beloved spake, he said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, come away. Come away from what? Come away from winter, which is a picture of death, John 5.24. Come away from what? Come away from rain, which is a picture of what? Judgment, John 3. Uh, but John 3.18. Come away from winter. Come away from rain. Come away what? To a new day. What's the new day? Spring's here now. Amen? Amen. I'm born again. John 3.3. 3, 1 Corinthians 5.17. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come. And the voice of the turtle is heard. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a turtle or talked to a turtle, turtles don't talk. <laughs> Amen? Uh, so, of course, I believe he's talking about the turtle dove. See, and of course the Holy Spirit is a dove. And uh, he's talking about the Holy Spirit speaks, but usually when He speaks, it's in an inaudible voice. Amen. He can speak to your heart. He can tell you this is right, this is wrong. But of course, some people don't know the voice of the Spirit because they've never been born again. And then verse 13, The fig tree putteth forth her green figs. And of course, Jesus talked about that in Matthew 24. How that... Uh, of course, when God's done with the church and fixing the rapture of the church, and immediately now He's going to start dealing with Israel again, like He promised in Daniel 8 and Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, 25, and 27. So, of course, the fig trees putting forth are green figs, because Israel's always likened to the fig tree. And the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and notice what He says again, come away. So He's not just coming to the earth but He's catching us away. Amen? His coming is imminent. The fig tree leaves are out. Harvest time is here. The reaper will soon be here. It's a come away, don't delay. Harvest time's here. The first fruit's left with Jesus. Now it's going to be the majority of the church. And then at the end of seven years, He'll just come back for the gleanings. Just before He sets foot on the land. At that post-trib rapture. So it's so awesome that the Bible lays it out so perfectly. But yet, people don't even know these, these verses are in the Bible. And they don't even know it's talking about Jesus and coming. But isn't it talking about how He descends and there's a voice? I'm talking about His voice. Isn't that what it's all about here in Song of Solomon? <coughs> Verse 8, This voice of my beloved, behold, He cometh, leaping on the mountains, singing, skipping up on the hills. I don't have all the verses here, but I know it's in my head, Zephaniah. And listen, when Jesus, Jesus comes... Uh, and rescues his lost lamb, he's carrying it on his shoulders and singing it a love story. It's a love song. Jesus sings a song. When he's carrying his lost sheep back home, it says in Zephaniah, he sings. Jesus sings. Zephaniah. Well, I need to write these verses down. This would make a good sermon. <laughs> Amen. Let's put that down there. Zephaniah. I'll look up the address later. <laughs> okay, let's get back here now. So again, he's coming into the atmosphere and he's calling his he's calls and guess what? His love goes. Amen. His love is not staying; she's leaving. <coughs> okay, how about the song of Solomon, uh, chapter six? See if anything else is in this song we can gather. Song of Solomon 6 and verse 8. Again, we see the same words used for his bride or his espoused. Song of Solomon 6 and verse 8. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my undefiled, is but one. She's the only one of her mother. She's the choice one of her that bare her. The daughter saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines 
and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? <laughs> uh oh, the fair one, the only one, the undefiled. Amen. Ephesians 4:4. 4, 4. Amen. His church is supposed to be undefiled. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. By one spirit are we all baptized in one body. Ephesians 5, 30 to 33. Amen. He loves his bride. He's, he loves his bride as his own self. Right. He's coming back for. Her. Amen. And of course, it's significant and interesting, I think, that when we get to the book of Acts, again, clearly. Jesus makes it very clear to the apostles, well, you can just forget this preaching on the kingdom of heaven. Don't even begin to worry about that silly little Matthew 13, the kingdom of heaven is like uh, wheat and tares. Jesus, when he last talks to the disciples, what does he tell them in Acts chapter 1? He says, fellas, your emphasis now is going to be the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. Amen? That's what he tells them. Acts 1 and verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and the cloud received him out of their sight. <coughs> and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand here gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you in heaven, into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. So again, here we see there's an emphasis placed on the fact that whenever he does come back, he will be coming back like when he left them here physically, visibly. They were standing there at the Mount of Olives. And then boom, he's taken up into the clouds out of their sight. And that's exactly what he's going to be doing. When he comes back, he's going to come back in the clouds. See, it matches exactly what Paul's saying here in 1 Thessalonians 4. So the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word should be established. Amen. Here even these angels know about Jesus coming back. We read last week about John the Baptist knew about it. Paul knew about it. Jesus knew about it. These angels knew about it. So it will be in the clouds. Look up, for your redemption draweth nigh, the Bible says. So he's going to descend. Jesus is just going to descend. He's just going to descend into the uh, atmosphere in the clouds. And then what's he going to do? Well, he's going to shout. He's going to shout, isn't he? The Lord will shout. Now, I believe, what will he do? What, when he shouts, what will he do? Well, I believe, number one, he'll call my name. Because look at John chapter 10, the Bible does say, doesn't it? In John chapter 10, Jesus is talking. In John 10, verse 3, him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. And leadeth them out. So if he's descending to take his church out and lead us out, and he's going to shout something, most likely then, according to John chapter 10, verse 3, it will be my name and your name, and all of his children's names. See? Amen? And we know in Revelation chapter 4 when John was given the revelation and he was sitting there on the Isle of Patmos in a cave because he was a prisoner on this cave and of course nobody could escape the, the, the island. It's just a giant rocky precipice out of the middle of the Mediterranean. And nobody had no boats. Nobody could get a boat close to it. It's sheer cliffs all the way around this place. And I've been there. That's why I know about it. 
And in Revelation chapter 4, it's interesting because what does God say to John as he's sitting there on the island in this prison for a whole year? After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So again, the voice had come up hither, and immediately, he was translated or raptured. And he's taken to heaven and shown all these wonderful things which he writes down for us in the book of Revelation. Amen? So we've looked at how he'll descend. We've looked at how he will shout. Now let's look at his voice as he shouts. Does the Bible say anything anywhere about his voice? What is the voice of the Lord like? Well, it's interesting because old Job had some buddies that were a great uh, comfort to him. <laughs> Not. <laughs> With friends like this, who needs enemies? Amen? And uh, the book of Job tells us in chapter 36, Elihu who's the uh, youngest fellow there, and he seems to be uh, respectfully letting all these other three fellows talk first. Because they're older than he is, he's shown respect to their age and all that. We believe he's the one who probably wrote the, the whole book of Job, the way the Bible speaks of his uh, jumping from <coughs> third person to first person and telling the narrative. Job 36:32. With the clouds he covereth the light, and commandeth it not to shine by the cloud that cometh through twigs. The noise thereof showeth concerning it, the kettle also concerning the vapor. At this also my heart trembleth, and is moved out of its place. What will take your heart and move it out of its place? Hear attentively the noise of his voice, and the sound... <coughs> that goeth out of his mouth. Sound, you mean it might sound like a trumpet talking to you? Isn't that what we just read in Revelation 4.1? He directeth it under the whole heaven. What, his voice and the sound of his mouth? And his lightning. In Luke 17.24, didn't Jesus say when he comes back it's going to be like the lightning that comes from the east to the west? John 12.29 his lightning under the ends of the earth. After it, after what? After the lightning. See? When Jesus sounds out with his voice, when his mouth sounds out, and he says, Dan Harden, come up hither, there's going to be lightning first under the ends of the earth. Then after that lightning, it. Now how many of you remember when you were little, you, your grandma or grandpa was saying, shh, sit down, let's be quiet. Lightning, thunder, storm outside. And they said, shh, sit down, be quiet. Sit down, be quiet. How many remember that happening when you were little? Well, what in the world were they listening for? Because after the lightning, Sunday, you're going to hear Jesus' voice. Amen. After it, a voice roareth. He thundereth with the voice of His excellency. And notice this. And He will not stay then when His voice is heard. Who's not staying? I'm not staying. When He comes back and He's talking with His voice and says, Come up hither, Dan Hart. I'm not staying. My heart's being moved, big boy. You think you're smart because in your brain you thought of a couple verses that you think are proof of whatever you believe. Listen, our God isn't known by memory. Our God has to be known by heart. Amen, my heart's moved. Amen, my heart's trembling. 
my heart's moved out of its place. Because, buddy, after the lightning, when he hollers that voice, Phew! I'm not staying. Ain't that what it says? Let's read it one more time. He will not stay then with his voice when, it, when his voice is heard. Amen? Amen. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Amen. There we are. Back to John 10. See his sheep. Know his voice. Do you know his voice? Amen. Does he know you? <laughs> Can you take me to the time and place where you were converted? God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. Amen. I mean, these are some fantastic verses, and yet how many times have you heard these verses mentioned? Probably not too many. But yet, they sure are pretty clear. <laughs> Maybe if some idiots would read these verses, they would realize maybe the Bible's right after all. And their cock and bull stories are a little bit shy. Uh, let's look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John 12, and verse uh, 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You had to have been there, man. And imagine, here Jesus is. He's praying to his Father. Amen. And all of a sudden, this voice pops out of nowhere. Amen. If this ain't God's voice, what is? Jesus says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. <laughs> The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. See, now, see, unbelievers, see, unbelievers just presumed it thundered. They could not, they don't know the voice of the Father. They don't know the Lord's voice. They've never been born again. See, God's secret is only with right, is not with the unrighteous. So when the unrighteous heard Jesus pray that, and heard God the Father answer him, they only heard it thunder. Did you get that? So we'll always remember that. When you're talking to one person and they hear something else, you know there's something wrong with them. Because it's like Paul said over there, well, you know, the natural man is not revealed to him. It's spiritually discerned. And if a man ain't saved, of course he can't hear. He ain't got the Holy Ghost in him. Exactly. First Corinthians 2.14 The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. <laughs> Jesus answered and said this voice came not because of me but for your sakes. Interesting, ain't it? Very interesting. <coughs> Now it's interesting too that the Bible says that there's the voice of the archangel. Now the only archangel in all the Bible is only one. It's not like the Catholic speech. There's not three archangels. You know, like the three uh, ninja turtles or something. <laughs> Amen. No, 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 no. When you talk about a cock and bull story, here we go again. But you might as well believe that. If you don't know the difference between kingdom God and kingdom heaven, like all Jehovah's witnesses and Catholics, you might as well believe that the three ninja turtles are the three... Uh, archangels, amen. <laughs> Michael, uh, Raphael, and uh, Donatello, or wherever it is. Let's look at Jude. Amen. There's this verse in Jude, just before the revelation. Verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, see, there's only one dude in the Bible, and that's Michael. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring again him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Okay, let's go to Daniel 12. Ezekiel, Daniel.
Daniel chapter 12, of course, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. See, this is why, why would Jesus come back and Jesus holler something and Michael holler something? Obviously, just like Daniel 9, 24, 25, and 27 teach. Because now, God is going to deal with Israel again, and the Jews again, and Jerusalem again. That's why He's going to mark the 144,000. Amen? So there's this clear demarcation. When does the time of Jacob's trouble start? When does the last seven years of Daniel's 9.27 begin? Well, obviously it's when this Antichrist dude is revealed, like it says in Revelation. That's why there's seven vials and seven trumpets and seven um, seals. Because it's a seven-year period. And Michael... He's going to get busy standing up for his people and for the Jews in Israel. And that's why finally, uh, Revelation 12 says, he will overcome the devil and his angels and cast them all down from heaven to the earth. And then the devil will know he has but a little time because he's got only a little time. Because uh, <coughs> Jesus is going to come back to the earth too and kick his butt. Now, it's interesting that the Bible speaks about that trump. I mentioned that to you a little bit last week. But now let's look up the verses. How about Numbers chapter 10? Numbers chapter 10. Now, here's where the Bible tells us that, yes, Israel had some silver trumpets. Two of them. Numbers 10 and verse 2. Make thee, not three, not one, make thee two trumpets of silver. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them. In other words, they can't be little trumpets or uh, that you put the sections together and put it to your lips. It's got to be one whole piece that thou mayest use them for the notice the two things it's used for for the calling of the assembly. Amen. Is that what the word church is called the called out assembly? Right. So the one horn of silver, one trumpet of silver, was to be blown for the calling of the assembly. In other words, call Israel. To, okay, take your tents down now. It's time to assemble. Get ready to move. So, boom. They start blowing that beautiful silver trumpet. And everybody knows, uh-oh, come on now. Put that stuff in the microwave. Let's go. <laughs> put, that in a, put that in the crock pot. Put that in the bucket. Put that in the box. Let's get loaded up. Put that on the camel. There you go. Box up the tabernacle. And then the second tube would be sounded and the second horn would sound and for the journeying of the camps. It was time to move. Time to journey. And then they shall blow with them. All the assemblies shall assemble themselves to the, to the door of the tabernacle congregation and if they blow but with one trump, trumpet then the princes which are heads of the thousands shall gather them so forth so on. When ye blow an alarm, then the camps that lie in the east part shall go forward. So forth so on. Isn't that interesting? Let's go to Exodus uh, 19. Okay, let's go to 13. Exodus 19, 13. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. <coughs> Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. As far as God calling Moses up and down the mountain to get the law and to write out the uh, ordinances. Because he went up and down the mountain many times. Uh, we see that God would signal to Moses when to come up. That's why there's this assumption that Michael was blowing a horn, see? 
<laughs> and he'll blow horn again. Uh, let's go to uh, 1960. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Whew. It had to be scary, didn't it? Can you imagine what that was like for them people? Verse 19, And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and wax louder and louder. Man, that had to be freaking them people out. Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. <laughs> That's some good stuff. Amen. And so one day, forgetting any of these verses are even in the Bible. So one day I'm sleeping, right? I'm sleeping, I'm what? Living on the mountain down there with Jesse Fife. How old I was that mom? There's a little charity where they're giving her a little bit of coffee with her chocolate syrup in the morning to calm her down. Chelsea syrup. How old were you? Yeah, how old was I, I wonder? Yeah, I about 27. Sorry, I'm 27 years old. And I'm sleeping. And as I and I, I have this dream, I'm, I'm dreaming. I, I see my feet, and my legs here, while I'm walking like this. And then all of a sudden, I see my feet leave the ground. And so, as I raise my head to see where I'm going, <laughs> I'm raising my head to see where I'm going, I hear this cacophony of noise, and it's getting louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And I wake up. I'm raising my head up, and I'm hearing this louder and louder. And then I wake up, and I wake up, and I said, Now, Lord, what was that about? Because the Bible says your dreams are based on your multitude of business during your day. So I'm thinking, Now, Lord, what in the world was that about? And then I figured it out. You know, we're spread out all over. You know, Brother Ray lives all the way over in Lincoln Park. And his son lives in Allen Park. and I live down here with Roe. Chris and Jess live over in Newport. If the Lord were to start rapturing me out in my house, it's going to take a few minutes for all of us from all over to get together up there. But as we get closer to each other, it's going to get louder. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You think you're going to leave here without a shout? You know what I mean? Man, if you've never shouted, you're going to be shouting like crazy then. That was the coolest dream. Because your brain's like a computer, you know, it's always working on stuff. So, in, my, in, in, in my dream, see, the Lord put that together for me, and I said, Paul, man, that's cool, man. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs> it's going to be neat. Woo-wee. And then lastly, we said, His dead arise. Amen. Amen. Coming back for us. Now, I used to, when I was young, I used to always pray, Oh God, help us all to go in the rapture. Don't let my mamma die. Don't let my grandpa die. Let us just all go off in the rapture because I didn't want to go to their funeral. You know? <laughs> Funerals are kind of scary. You know, They've always been scary to me. But the older uh, I've become, the more I have thought, Well, wait a minute. Who wants to go to Cedar Point and not write all the rights? You know what I'm saying? But what's the sense of going if you're going to write all the rights? You know what I'm saying? And I got thinking about it one day, and I thought, you know what? That might be pretty cool to die and be thrown down on the ground, you know what I mean? And when the Lord comes back, come back with him, you know, and then go down on the ground and pop out of the ground and scare everybody, like Superman, you know what I mean? And then the live people that are saved, they're changed a moment, twinkling of an eye, and then they fly out, and we all go meet the Lord in the air, so we'll never be with the Lord. And the more I thought about it, I said, you know what? I think I want to go... I think I want to go ahead and uh, go for the whole rides, all the rides. Go, go, f- do it all. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So I don't pray no more. Oh Lord, come back and let's rapture us all out. I say, come on, Lord, take me where you want me. Amen. 
And if you want me to die, that's okay. Because I'm looking forward to coming out of the, uh, on the roller coaster. Amen. <laughs> Isaiah 26, 19. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. See, the Old Testament has got the New Testament in it contained. And the New Testament has the Old Testament in it explained. So that's why it's so neat to read these verses. Now that we've got the New Testament to make and make sense of these verses, like we showed you there Sunday, like Peter said, even the prophets, they didn't clearly understand all the things they were writing. Well, now that we've got a New Testament to compare it with, now it makes total sense. See? Now it's, now it's all hindsight 2020. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body, shall they arise. Now, did that happen in Matthew 27, 51? Absolutely. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. Well, in my Father's house are many mansions. Of course I'm going to the chambers, amen. And shut thy doors about thee, hide thyself as it were for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. What have we got to hide ourselves from? Well, 2 Thessalonians 5, from the evil. From the wrath of God that's coming down on the earth. He's arranged it so that we would escape. See? Like he said in 1 Thessalonians 5. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So that's why we go to be the Lord for seven years, and at the end of that seven years, He comes back riding white horse. We're right behind Him. Riding horses right behind Him. Amen? The Revelation. Chapter 20 says this. In verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no part, but they be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, amen. The first resurrection has three stages to it. Matthew 27 talks about the first phase. Let's read it because I read where I think it was George. Somebody quoted this verse recently. And when they explained it, they explained it totally wrong. <laughs> Let's read it. Matthew 27, 51. Verse 50 says, When Jesus, Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was written twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. So, so when Jesus was hanging on the cross, and he cried out with a loud voice, and he gave up the ghost, there was an earthquake at that second. <laughs> When that earthquake, that's when God did rip the veil of the temple from top to bottom. And at that instant, all the, these graves and the graves were open. And whereas up to that time there may have even been some rocks that didn't have cracks in them, but ever since then rocks had cracks in them. See there? And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. So the rocks were all busted and got cracks in them. And that's not all. This earthquake was so great that also, and the graves were open. So here's Jesus hanging on a cross. He gives up the ghost, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Boom. Now everybody who leaves the cross and goes home to eat their spaghetti suppers or whatever they got to eat that night, they're walking by graveyards where <laughs> the graves are open. They can see dead bodies laying down in the graves still. But again, it's dark. 
it's just three hours till they ain't allowed to do nothing because it's going to be a feast of unleavened bread and they ain't allowed to, they got to treat it like a, a Sabbath day and they can't do no work or do nothing. The graves were opened, many of the bodies of the saints were slept the rose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. Now there wasn't nobody up walking around because Jesus died on the cross. No, the graves were all open and they noticed that as they went home. But after three days and nights, in other words, when they finally got their Sabbath behind them and everything for the whole weekend, and they went out then on Sunday, the first day of the week, to start covering up the graves, to their shock and surprise, <laughs> there wasn't nobody in the grave. Some would have just discovered, wow, that's funny, I could have swore when we walked by here there was somebody in there, but something's happened over the last three days and nights. It must have been a grave robber or something. But yet the Bible says, oh, no, no, no. Other people clearly saw those people that were in the graves because they popped out, out of their graves alive when Jesus arose out of his grave alive. The graves were open, and many bodies of the saints were slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Again, when you know the narrative and you know how Jesus... Uh, talked to the girls there, and to their surprise, he was Jesus, and he says, don't touch me, I haven't ascended to the Father yet, but I'm hanging around talking to you. In other words, since he'd been up for probably 12 hours, it was fright night, it was the first Halloween night, All Hallows' Eve, or what do you want to call it, because these dead people whose graves were uncovered when Jesus popped out of the ground, well, they popped out of the ground with him because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he's the first fruits of the resurrection. So he comes out of the ground and these Old Testament saints here, it clearly says they came out of the grave too. And since they came out of the grave and they couldn't go straight to heaven yet, they're not down in Abraham's bosom no more. They're not down in paradise. But now they're physically, visibly risen from the dead because they, they which slept the rose. And they're scratching their heads saying, well, man, this ain't heaven. I don't know where we're at. This is, this is old Jerusalem. Sure enough, this is the holy city. Let's go get a newspaper and see what year we're in. <laughs> so they're down there scaring people to death. Some of them knocking on the door. And, well, Uncle Mordecai, we just buried you last week. What are you doing here? You know, and they're sitting around ratchet jaw talking to people and stuff. Until finally Jesus talks to the girls, you know, when the sun's coming up. And he says, well, uh, i got to get out of here. i got to go send to the Father. We'll see you later. Bye. Tell my disciples I'll meet them, so forth, so on. Finally, Jesus pulls out of there and boop, there they go off to. Pretty simple, but hard to believe, amen? So 1 Corinthians 15 talks about every man in his own order. The first fruits, which of course, like we just read in Matthew 27, 52 to 53. Then there's a, the, the mass of the harvest, which of course will be the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians 4. But then too, is there any gleanings? Of course, all harvests have three stages. First fruits, which is just a few of the tomatoes that turn early, amen. That's what the resurrection of Jesus and the Old Testament saints like. It's like the first tomatoes that turn red. Then what happens? Then there's a big harvest where all the tomatoes seem to turn red at once. And they all have to be harvested. And then you've got to go back for one more harvest. Amen? One more. There's three stages to that first resurrection. Let's go to Matthew 24. Let's see where Jesus called, talked about it here. This was this what we call the, the rapture of the post-trip saints because the Bible doesn't speak of such a thing. Matthew 24 and verse 31. But see, people like to argue a pre-trib versus post-trib. Pre-trib versus the uh, first fruits. No, no, it's not one against the other. It's all or all of them. All right, because they're all in the Bible. You know, all the Bible's true. But that's right, maybe you don't get all scriptures given by the inspiration of God. You can't get that either. It's Matthew 24, 31. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. <laughs> Amen. Notice the trumpet. Isn't that interesting? Look at verse uh, 
40, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. So there's some blessed truths there, amen? Now let me say this. Uh, the mystery of the rapture. <coughs> this is a mystery. <coughs> of course, <coughs> your average Catholic and your average Jehovah Witness can't get it. Of course. What do you expect? They're lost people. Pretending to be spiritual. Pretending to be righteous. Definitely put me and you to shame knocking on doors and crossing ourselves and denying something for 40 days for Lent and uh, repeating the same prayers over and over and over and over again. Just like some of us don't read our Bibles over and over and over again. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15. That's why the, even Paul says, you know, you can respect these people for will worship. When it comes to making themselves do stuff and have a will to force themselves to control themselves, to keep saying the same prayers all over and over and over, and uh, do the goofy things they do because they got to prove their religiosity. You know, you can respect them because, man, they got some discipline that a lot of saved people don't even seem to have. Just saved people seem to be awful lazy sometimes. But look at 1 Corinthians 15. Let's see what he says here. 1551, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, you see, he clearly calls it a mystery. So, of course, if you're not a proper steward of the mysteries, like Paul explained earlier in 1 Corinthians, then you ain't going to be able to figure nothing out. This is a great mystery of the rapture. And it is not to be ignored by believers. Because like we already read in 1 Corinthians 4, he said these, you're to comfort one another with these words. So if you don't know this and you don't believe in it, you can't comfort nobody, can you? Right. Right. Yep. Thinking I gotta go through and take a mark of the beast or be damned or watch my killed children suffer and get stung by monsters and bit by monsters and snake head tails on lion breathing monsters. That's a comfort. <laughs> Please change the channel, man. I must be in the twilight zone. <laughs> Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. So in other words, there's going to come a time when we that are alive right now and a part of the church right now, like Paul was right then, and we still are right now, because Jesus ain't come back yet, some people will be alive when He comes back. We'll be changed when? In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. Now what is the twinkling of an eye? You know, the, the perverted versions want to say in the winking of an eye. Are you kidding? Did you know a wink of an eye is a slow thing? Compared to the twinkling of an eye? The twinkling of an eye is how long as it takes you, your eye to look at that camera. Then quit looking at the camera look at my face. Now, that's pretty fast. Your iris, your eye can focus from that to this and this to that. That's a twinkling. And as fast as your eye can focus from one thing to the next, that's how quick Jesus is coming back to get you. Amen. Like I said, you'll be watching your feet walking on sidewalk one second, and then you'll watch your feet flying through the air, and you'll be looking up to see what you're looking at before you can look at it. Boom! <laughs> You're going to be with all your friends and neighbors and loved ones. <coughs> and then you'll get to meet the Lord being the air. Amen? We're going to have a big open-air meeting. So if you don't believe in open-air meetings, man, you must be miserable because you're headed for one. Amen? <coughs> so this great mystery of the rapture, it's not to be ignored. Amen? It's not to be ignored. In a moment, the twinkle of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised in corruptible. See, it matches perfectly what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4. When the trump goes off, and Michael blows that horn, that first toot, the dead people jump out first. 
Then, by the time you finally get to the second two, then the, then us live people get to take off, see? The moment twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the dead people jump out of the ground first with a brand new body like Superman. Can't be hurt, can't be damaged, can't die no more. They come out of the ground with a new body. No blood, no clothes, of course. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal shall put on immortality, even we that are alive walk and see it's almost like boom, then we almost like die and get a new body instantly before we can even drop to the ground. Like you said, the twinkling of an eye, shoom, all of a sudden, man, we got a glorified body. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, so in the twinkling of an eye, boom, we're dropping this robe of flesh and it rots and stinks and got B.O. And all of a sudden, man, before, our, before we can hit the ground, and before our clothes can even hit the ground, boom, we're changed. And we got an incorruptible body just like Jesus Christ. We're a glorified saint. And got a body that can no longer rot, no more have B.O. And then no more dragon breath. This mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. Thanks be to God, which giveth us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Now, this is interesting. Unmovable. Now, maybe you don't fully understand all this and know exactly how it fits in with everything in the book of Revelation or everything in the parables or anything. But that's okay. You're still to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen? But I'm talking about this mystery of this rapture, how it's not to be ignored by believers. This great event for born-again believers will occur just prior to the tribulation period, and the tribulation is called Jacob's Trouble. It's not called the church's trouble. Amen? Amen. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. That rapture experience of John is recorded in Revelation 4. All the way up to verse 5, before the seal judgments of the tribulation period are even talked about. This mystery was not revealed until Paul, but the promise of a post-tribulation resurrection was clearly promised to the nation of Israel. Look at Psalms 50. Psalms chapter 50, verses 4 and 5. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Isn't that interesting? Of course, we've already looked at uh, Isaiah 26. Let's go to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. Here's that beautiful story of the Valley of Dry Bones. Where again, God is dealing with Israel and He's going to gather them together like a valley full of dry bones. And He's going to cause them to arise. They're spiritually dead today, but there's coming a day He's going to call them back into His favor. And this is in this 37th chapter. And when I beheld, lo, verse 8 says, the sinos and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Why? Because they're spiritually dead. And so he's going to start dealing with Israel again. He's going to gather them again. Like two sticks. He's going to string them together. Now the born again believer has the great promise of eternal security. But the tribulation will operate under a faith and work system where it's a believing in Jesus and not taking the mark of the beast. With all that entails. The Bible is very, very, very clear about that. 
so much so that some people make the mistake of thinking they're in it now. And of course they're not. <laughs> There's nobody forcing you to take a name, number, or mark yet. And that dude ain't been revealed yet. And Jesus talking about that stuff says here in Matthew 24, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Meaning, yeah, if you can make it to the end without compromising and taking that name, number, or mark of the beast, then you'll get to see the Lord come back and rescue those post-trip saints. Yeah. But see, there's some endurance to it. There's some living in fear. Whereas the Bible says we're living perfect love in First John 4.18. But we're going to even see that in Peter, where Peter's going to talk about how, man, I'll make sure you live your life in hoping and in fear. Wait a minute. Why would I want to be hoping and in fear? Well, what do you expect from a little book just for the book of Revelation? <laughs> Don't you think Peter's probably talking to 144,000? But we'll get into that later, amen? Let's go to Hebrews 6 again. If the Bible is very clear in Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, that yes, he's going to really deal with Israel during the tribulation period and getting uh, Israel ready for his coming back and setting up the kingdom where the whole world will be blessed for 1,000 years through Jesus running the world from Jerusalem that it only makes sense that he'd write to the Hebrews and say this in Hebrews chapter 6. Paul says, We're not of them who draw back on perdition, but of them that believe the saving of the soul. What? That sounds like somebody could go back. Yeah, they can, because look at Revelation 14, where he says it, black and white letters, you can't miss it. Amen. 14.12 <laughs> Let's back up a little bit. Verse 11. Yeah, I like this. Let's start at 9. <laughs> the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented day, tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they shall have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that, notice what it says, Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. See, it's a belief in Jesus, but there's some works involved. There's some doing the commandments. Thank God I ain't trying to do no commandments. <laughs> Jesus is the end of the law for me. He is my Sabbath. I'm resting in Him. I've been given everlasting life, and I can't be condemned. I shall not come into condemnation. Jesus is my Savior. Then I'm doing nothing to earn my salvation. That's why I can rest in Him. But see, that's a different promise. I'm, in, I'm living in a different dispensation. Oh, I must be a dispensation. It's like Paul. Amen, I am. There's clearly a difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. There's clearly a difference between a New Testament church and a tribulation church. Amen. Total difference. The word rapture stems from the Latin word rapier, which means to seize by force. And the Lord Jesus will shout, come up hither and seize his possessions from the earth. Amen. The first trump will call the dead in Christ to rise and possibly will... Uh, Then the last trump will sound for living Christians to mysteriously be transformed and transported into heaven as Enoch was translated before the flood. Hebrews 11.5 This is a miraculous victory over death and the grave. And the unsaved will hear the trumps like thunder that warn of a coming storm. And Elijah and the sons of the prophets knew of Elijah's departure 
2 Kings 2, 1 to 12. And faithful believers know of their departure. And if people can't get it, because they're not his. They're not his. Second Thessalonians five. Or uh first Thessalonians five, I mean. Verse one. But the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need I write of you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in light. Now, do you know that perfectly? See, some people don't know that perfectly. And that's why they haven't come back ever since we talked on this subject. And some others even heard a little bit. But why ain't they back here tonight? Because they're afraid if they heard it perfectly. Now they've got more to give an account to God, so they're fooling around somewhere else in the building now. But there's a God in heaven. He knows. Yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall cometh as a thief in the night. And when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travails of a woman with child, and they shall not escape. God's wrath is coming, and it's coming for all those that are unbelievers, <coughs> but not his children. His children know that he takes good care of his children. You can trust him. He's not a mean God. He's not going to put you in like fire for a thousand years. And then you finally get your eternal life like Joey Faust teaches. There's another perfect example of a lost man who's a pastor. Street preaches every week. Yeah, he better and he better do more than that too because, man, you know, his eternity's based on what he's doing. Because he believes that, yes, if he's not one of the righteous at the time of the rapture, he will be left behind. He's all screwed up. But he calls himself a Baptist. <laughs> what a joke. To my knowledge, there's not a Baptist that's ever ordained him. He just ordained himself. you got to watch that too. People say, oh, I'm going to prove you my faith by my works. I'm going to prove my faith by my works. Well, hey, there's a verse that says, okay, well, you mean you got works? Like, don't, don't forsake the assembly of yourself together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, is the day of the Antichrist getting closer for you? Well, how are you cheating church more? Oh, no, instead, oh, no, I'm going to withdraw myself and just study on the Internet. <laughs> you're not showing nobody no faith by no words. Oh, you're, you can make a bunch of stuff up. Oh, I gave Brother Dan. I, 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 I. Well, let's not stop there. Let's put it all on there. Did you do anything for anybody else? Put it all on there. Now, when you're done, let me ask you a question. What have you done for Jesus? Yeah, I grant you, if you're doing something for accolades and gateway, you're probably going to get it. It's like I tell everybody that comes to me, says, Brother Dan, I'd like to paint this. Would, you, would that be all right? Well, if you think the Lord wants you to. How many of you have ever heard me say that? If you think the Lord wants you to. If you think the Lord wants you to. Hey, don't be doing nothing for me. Because guess what? I can't repay you. If you do anything for me, I can't repay you. So I'm not going to encourage you to do anything for me. Because I can't repay you. But if the Lord tells you to do something, well, hey, that's the right reason to do anything. Right. Amen. But if you think somehow I've got to give you accolades or make you the fourth person to Trinity or make you the associate pastor or something like that, it probably ain't going to happen. Amen. Because the Lord ain't told me to do that. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. For I am now ready to be offered at the time of my departure is at hand. Ah. Paul knew that he was ready to be offered and the time of his departure was at hand. Sounds to me like the Lord kind of has his people know when it's time for their departure. And if you don't, when, you don't know when your departure is, then you probably ain't one of his. Paul knew when his departure was going to be, amen? Yeah. Mother and uh, some other relatives years ago when I was a kid. Yeah. They would say, "Well, Mama, this is my grandmother. She says, she says, she tells me, she's a child, talking to her children. She says, now the Lord's coming for me. It's the hour, two hours before, whatever it was. She's not talking to you, Fred.' And uh, 
lot, a lot of them, I think it was my mother or somebody said, that they could smell a very sweet aroma in the room and nobody had brought anything in. And I've heard that time and time from the old folks. Yes. That were really, uh, that really believed. They didn't have much. All they had was the Lord and uh, what he provided for them. Right. And it was just, uh, to me, as a child, that was so amazing, you know, to hear something like that. Yes. Yeah, I believe those things, man. I believe those stories, too. Because, again, they've got the ring of Scripture to it. Genesis 35, 18. It came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Her soul was in departing, amen? Mm -hmm. She died in childbirth, bringing Benjamin into the world. Joseph's little brother. <coughs> she called his name uh, Benoni, which is son of sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, son of his right hand. And his favorite wife died, Rachel. So, Paul spoke of his departure being at hand. Look at Philippians 1.23. I found a way to break it. Philippians 1.23. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Amen. Are you looking forward to departing? Hmm. 